one bit of advice that someone gave me starting out was, hey, when you're drawing a sketch, if you're drawing it digitally or you're drawing it traditionally, flip it around. Flip it around so you can see your mistakes. A professional is someone who makes mistakes but catches them before they're final. So don't worry if your first couple of sketches are, are not where you want them to be. Uh, it's going to get there through your refining process. Hello to all of you watching at home. You are now in the New York Comic Con Metaverse. This is a masterclass on illustrating for television, script to screen. My name is Afua Richardson and I will be taking you through this journey. I am the illustrator who is responsible for Diana Freeman's comics on the HBO series Lovecraft Country. So I'm super excited to show you just how we got that done. Behind the scenes, the, uh, the scripts, the concepts, as well as some of the problems that we had to overcome, uh, but I was up to the challenge. So if there is something that you would like to know that I haven't covered, be sure to you know, click a like and leave a comment below. Working on a series like Lovecraft Country was really exciting. It was very fast paced, so there was not a lot of room for error. I had to get a client brief, hop into a meeting, and be able to turn around art very, very quickly because having that many schedules and that many moving pieces really requires a lot of organization. So I really had to bring my A game for this. Uh, I was responsible for creating the hand-drawn illustrations for Diana Freeman, who we were introduced to in episode one. Diana Freeman, or Dee, is played by the incredibly talented actress Jada Harris. She was really, really cool to work with and I had the opportunity to teach her how to draw so that when she had my illustrations under her hand, it seemed natural for her to complete the lines. So part of my job, in addition to creating the work, was teaching Jada how to finish it. Some of the challenges were being able to create something really, really cool with supplies that were sitting around her house. So there were no fancy markers, no crazy Wacom tablets, no crazy uh, amazing technology to work with. Just pencil, paper, maybe white out. It really limited my palette, but I had to come up with something that really also conveyed the time period, uh, as well as her view of the world. I had a chance to sit down with director Misha Green as well as JP, and they let me know basically what it is they were looking for and how much time I had to do it. The first project that we really, really sunk our teeth into were the Atlas drawings. These were the drawings that were inside Dee's father's map, the Atlas. My dad used to have one of those. It was one of those kind of indestructible books that you could pour coffee on and still find your way through America. So one of the challenges initially was being able to draw right on the paper. The paper itself was waxy, so anything that we drew on top of it, rolled right off. Uh, in addition to that, we tried drawing them on separate pieces of paper, cutting them out, and then gluing them on top, but that didn't really look good either. So what we finally came up with was illustrations that I drew by hand, scanned, created a digital cutout, and we reprinted the map pages with the drawings on top of them. And then me and JP went back, with color pencil, crayon, and anything that we could find within the limited palette, that is. And we drew right on top of it to make it look like it was drawn right on the paper. JP, who is amazing, he went through and he bound the atlas himself. A lot of the books that you see on set were handmade. It was absolutely incredible. I, I, I wanted to learn how to bind books. <laughs> Got my script, got my creative brief notes, got my deadline. First thing was sketches. I had to come up with a whole bunch of different variations for the Atlas drawings. Now in the pilot episode, they already had 
uh, a set of drawings and I'm going to show you some of those. And side by side, I will compare them to what they had versus what I had to create, which was kind of fun for me. It was like, challenge, you make this better. Um, D is the daughter of George Freeman or Uncle George, who we get introduced to in Lovecraft Country episode one. George is the researcher and writer of the Safe Negro Travel Guide, which is based uh, historically on the, the Green Book, which was created by Victor Hugo Green from the 1930s to about 1966. It was a journal that was published, I believe, annually. And what it entailed was different destinations around America during segregation that would either serve or not serve African Americans in America, especially motorists. Motorists who didn't want to deal with the hassle of public transit and sitting in the back of the bus uh, needed to know safe places they could go where they were welcome. It essentially meant the difference between life or death. So the Atlas drawings to me are Dee's representation of her father's travels. If he went somewhere and they were friendly, she would represent it with a tavern or a friendly barkeep. But in the instances where he traveled to a place like Artem, that would be represented by a monster, a grim reaper, a vampire, or even a clansman holding a noose. So Dee has a very vivid imagination as she takes the things from her experience and represents them in these little icons. So I had fun going through and making ogres and vampires and werewolf guys. And here's a look at some of them up close so you can see a little bit more detail. They're only on screen for just a few seconds, but here you get a chance to see what was the, the concept, a couple of the rejected ones, and finally, the end result. One way to make sure that your artwork really gets out there is having a really presentable website. I know that sounds pretty standard these days, but how your website is presented really represents you. If you have something that's kind of cluttered and all over the place and it's not very clear what it is that you do exactly, then people are not going to have an idea of what you do and why they should hire you for this job. One thing that I think that I'm known for is really, really vivid colors and the diversity of the characters that I create. I like to create characters from all over the world. So specifically for Lovecraft Country, they wanted to be able to focus on African-American superheroes, which happens to be my specialty since I worked on Black Panther. Um, so for the first meeting with Misha and JP, they started to go over the client brief. And the client brief is basically just an outline of what they're looking for, what they expect, roughly like the feeling the idea how many pages it is and when they need it so i make sure no matter where i go i carry a sketchbook i'm always practicing and also i try to go in the direction of my fears so if you're not very good at hands and for a lot of beginner artists hands are the things that they try to avoid draw your own hand every day every day practice 50 hands because practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. So the more you learn and the more you see and the more you practice representing things that you see, when you sit down and you draw things out of your imagination, you'll already have a well of information that you're drawing from. 
you can't really give what you don't have. So be sure to be patient with yourself and, and be kind to yourself. You're at this phase in your journey and it's really easy to look online and feel like, oh my God, I'm not very good compared to all of these people. But each of these people on their journey are just at a different road stop along the way. So you're going to get there, but you have to get past all of the basics. And so even me at this phase in my career, I still go over the basics because no matter what I'm learning, no matter what new program I'm trying to figure out or trying to observe new ways to represent, represent the things that I want to imagine, going over those fundamentals over and over again just solidify my foundation. Another thing that I like to do to really push my work forward is teach. The thing that really helps narrow down your process and make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, you're doing it concisely in the most efficient way possible is being able to tell it to other people. If you find that you're you're starting to ramble and go on, then maybe you need to refine your process and get it down to the key points so that you yourself have a roadmap as to how you complete the work that you would like to do. As soon as you learn something, teach it to somebody else. It keeps the information going, but also it solidifies it in your mind. I'm going to show you how I come up with my composition, my grids. Basically, when I sit down to paper, this is my process for coming up with ideas for comic book covers or even anything that I'm drawing. Sometimes you get stuck and you don't really know what to draw. So I'm gonna walk you through my process. Ready? All right, let's go. We're going to make a mock cover for Arinthia Blue versus Cthulhu. All right, here we go. So first thing I do, sometimes I have no idea what I wanna draw. Not at all. Not a single solitary idea. So even if I have an inkling or I'm completely blank, what I'll start with is my compositional grid. And what I will do is whatever the size of my paper, that should be you know, known from your client brief, I will set up the parameters. So I'll start with the color, like a blue or red, something very, very vivid, and I'll make a new layer. And I'll choose a brush, something that is big, but not too big. And from the very corner of my composition, I will draw a line from one corner to the other. And I'll do the same thing the other way. The reason that this is important is because this gives me the exact center of my composition. So I know when I fold this piece of paper in half, that's going to be the middle line. X marks the spot. So this is what I have to deal with, this area here. And then I'll continue to draw the diagonals in place so I know when I'm creating all the pieces, the topography, the, the logo, the lettering, and the characters, I have enough room to fit everything on the page. And sometimes while I'm in this process, if I'm thinking about my theme, Cthulhu versus Arinthia Blue, ideas will start to pop up. I'll start to think about what can I create to express what it is I'm trying to make. Do I wanna have a sense of dread? Is she being overpowered by this giant challenge of a monster? Or does she have the upper hand and, she and she's not afraid? So um, how to position those characters in relationship to the other is vital in expressing what it is you're trying to convey. So, now that I have a handy dandy grid here, you don't have to get too elaborate with it. Um, but I like to set up my grid so I can see four distinct areas. This is one half of my composition. So this is going to be my comic cover. We'll do that so we can see 
the other side and see through that. I've set my layers from normal to multiply and that kind of makes it like glass so you can see what's behind it. Um, and the other side is the back. So for Arinthia Blue, every single issue of Arinthia Blue had an ad and a shout out to the Safe Negro Travel Guide. And since I've drawn that already, I will go ahead and lay that on top. So everything that I make will be in relation to the Safe Negro Travel Guide. Another thing that is really helpful about creating a grid like this is you kind of give yourself a roadmap, a little bit of an area. You wanna make sure also that you have a bleed. If you're printing something, it's really important to give yourself space. Uh, you can set up whatever parameter that is for you, but do keep in mind that um, you don't want your type to go right up to the edge. So you wanna create a safe zone. So what I'm doing is I am digitally making a guide. One thing that I have to keep in mind is the type. Orinthia Blue is a huge part of the composition. It takes up almost a third of the entire comic book cover. And the reason that I did that was because I wanted to make sure that even though it's far away, it can still be seen and read. So I'm going to borrow this from the Interplanetary Adventures of Arinthia Blue issue one. Copy that. And delete the rest. So this is what I have to work with. So even though this is half of my composition here, I now only have this box to work in. I'm going to color that green just so I can see it. So that's it. In that little box, I have to come up with Cthulhu versus Orinthia Blue. So I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to leave that up. Change the opacity here so I can see what I'm working with. And just to give myself a, a, an easier canvas to work on, I'm going to drop a transparent layer here. Ooh, not in green. And I'm going to lower the opacity just a little bit so I can see what I'm working on, but still have my grid underneath. All right. So I'm gonna make a new layer. And even though I'm working traditionally on this, I like to lay things out digitally so I can print it out and work right from this as a guide so uh, I have enough space to uh, execute what it is uh, I'd like to do. So now we get to the sketching. So Cthulhu. Cthulhu is way bigger than Orinthia. So let's say He's gonna take up this area right here. And then his little tentacles are gonna be coming for. And I like to work from basic shapes because if you kind of go in too soon and start forming really complicated ideas, you might not have enough room for it. So Cthulhu is an egg starts. I'll choose another color for our hero. Orinthia is facing us. Well, she's battling Cthulhu, but it's important to see your character's face. So I'm going to block her out. And I like to give myself a few options. So what is she doing? Is she scared? 
Is she fighting? Is she preparing herself? Uh, is she startled? So I'm just going to block out just a really advanced stick figure. It's an advanced stick figure. Don't let anybody tell you that stick figures are not useful. And look at that, I've run out of room. So I can squish, change the size, and make sure that I don't run out of room. Or I can decide to make it bigger and cut off part of her boots. Or even overlap it with the top. That's option one. Let's figure out another pose. And another method of creating a pose in addition to making big blobs i like to break the body down into shapes almost like you're drawing through and if you could assemble them like a a figure or a doll you would see all of the parts and how it connects like the cool machine the human body is. Since the hero is the focus, I want to make sure that she's not overshadowed by anything else. She's the most important part. You have to think about not only what it is that you're drawing, but the shape of what you're drawing and how that translates into a full drawing. If you can, if you like drawing figures more than you like drawing backgrounds, I would, on another piece of paper, if you can, if you're working digitally, create a new layer and outline the shape of your character as a whole. All right, this doesn't seem like a lot, but we have a general idea of where she is, what she's doing, and her general superhero-y shape. You can adjust and make something more dynamic. It's important when you have references and things like that to keep them close by because you have to be consistent. Sometimes when you're drawing, you just forget what the character looks like. So you now I'm gonna create my eye shapes. Eyes really tell a lot about what the character is feeling. So if the lids are closed or the eyebrows are low to the eye, it definitely depicts anger or concern or I ain't tolerating no Cthulhu mess isms, whatever that expression is. If you're drawing or mapping out a face, the very middle of the eye gives you a map for the corners of the mouth. And the ear starts at the top of the brow. The bottom of the ear gives you the bottom of the nose. So your eyes are kind of like a map for your face. The length of your eye determines the length of your nose, part, and this space in between here. Uh, right in between the eyes, I should say. Because you can't see what I'm talking about. So now I've got a nose and the corners of the mouth. Then we can start going in and filling in some details on our ink layer. Since I have a ginormous dome, um, at least that's what my mama said, I tend to draw heads too big. So be careful <laughs> when you zoom in too far <laughs> that you don't lose sight of the scale that you're working in. 
Remember when I told you about professionals catching their mistakes? Caught one. You want to kind of avoid over rendering things. You want to give yourself enough details to draw with, but not so much that you're drawing the exact same thing five and six times over. In the comic book world, usually jobs are broken up into five or six different categories. You've got the thumbnails and pencils. You've got inks, colors, letterers, edit editors, and um, those jobs can sometimes be done all by the same person. Um, but in comics, there's usually a team of people who handle that job. But in this instance, I had to do all of those things and I was absolutely up for the challenge. Now, I know this seems very, very simple. And the reason that I made it this simple is because I have to draw this for D. I want to make sure that it's not so, so complicated that it's not realistic that a teenager in 1955 Chicago I can't replicate this. Now it looks like we've lost our Cthulhu just a little bit. So that's why I like doing thumbnails like this because it gives me the opportunity to change my mind. So say that doesn't quite work and that's not what I want. I can try again a number of different ways, you know, incorporating the background and stuff like that into the composition. But this is basically how I get started on all of my comic book work. I set up a grid, make sure I keep my type in mind. I figure out what the players are and I try to make sure I convey whatever it is that I'm, I'm trying to express uh, through the actions and the placement of the characters. I just wanted to give a shout out to all of my friends and followers and art appreciators online. Thank you so much for your questions and your input and just letting me know what it is you wanted to see in this video. If you missed that or if you're not following me online, you can check me out at Instagram at Doctafu, D-O-C-T-A-F-O-O. -O. On Facebook and on Twitter, my name, Afua, A-F-U-A Richardson. If you found this masterclass helpful or you know someone who's interested in illustration for television or comic books, be sure to share it, like it, and subscribe.